Hey guys, welcome back to the Farris Fit Podcast. Uh, great to be back with you guys. I am here today with somewhat of a weightlifting legend, uh, Derek Johnson. Uh, Derek, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, great to have you on the podcast, finally. Thanks for having me. If you guys don't know who Derek is, uh, Derek is the youngest international coach in the history of USA weightlifting. Uh, along with being a Team USA team member uh, and USA Weightlifting's Development Coach of the Year, Derek is the only coach in the world to have three senior world team members from three different countries, Brazil, Canada, and the US. Derek has also coached a lifter to the 2012 Olympics, uh, represented in Brazil, and is the youngest level five coach in USAW history. Uh, Derek has also become uh, the first African-American to be named head coach of an international team for USA weightlifting. Uh, so quite, a, quite a, a repertoire you have there, quite, a, uh, quite an incredible introduction. Um, and Emily introduced me to Derek uh, actually a few years ago now, but it's been, um, we never gotten to work together before, but finally we're getting to work together in some fashion with this new, uh, this, this charity event we've come, got coming up, this powerlifting event, which we're trying to raise money for the Kings of Weightlifting. So I kind of wanted to start this podcast off for the people that don't know what the Kings of Weightlifting uh, organization is. Can you let everybody know what it is, what it does and what, what its purpose is? Well, the Kings of Weightlifting is this free after school program in South Central Los Angeles. It's a working class neighborhood, underserved area. And so my program brings Olympic weightlifting there, physical training, sports development, or just sometimes the kids don't even work out and we talk, we just talk mm -hmm. about life. And the, and the idea behind Kings of Weightlifting is, well, 25 years ago, I started at this free after school inner city program in St. Louis, Missouri. And so that's how I got the chance, the opportunity to become a weightlifter because I could have never been able to afford it. I came from welfare section eight, uh, one of the most violent neighborhoods in America, one of the most poverty stricken areas in all of the United States. And so I just would have never had opportunity to play or, or do a sport like weightlifting. And so the idea behind weightlifting or, or the Kings of weightlifting was to pay it forward. Okay, I'm here in Los Angeles, I'm, I'm established, let's, Let's see if I can give opportunities or help give opportunity to the next generation of kids. And so that's why I developed uh, the Kings of Wayla thing almost five years ago. Oh, five years ago. Great. And how many, how many kind of kids have, have been through this program? So we've had over 250 kids wow. come, come to the program. Uh, yeah, I remember the, it was just this idea and I was like, I need to carry this out. I, I need to do this. I remember I had bought all the equipment and within the first two months, there was no money left whatsoever. It was like, okay, how are we going to make this work? And so you just, so you just learn the business uh, or, or learn the nonprofit and how everything needs to work. We need to have this, we need to have that. Okay. But we still need to be here coaching the kids and firing right. them. Up. And, and that's been the journey. And it was just, just a mission of mine that and I'm going to carry this out and see, and see it happen amazing and did you set up your your own gym or do you do it in other people's gyms or how does it work uh our gym is set up in it's a uh community center in that area right. so we have space in that in that particular area uh we're about one mile from watts a couple miles from compton california if people are familiar with that yeah the same. uh Cause at first I was, I was like, we got to raise so much money. How are we going to do this? How are we going to open? And then I said, collaboration. Yeah. And so sure. I went to college for political science and it was all about making connections, networking and collaborations. Yeah. Uh, and, and definitely if any entrepreneurs are listening or people that are, that have dreams, collaborations. For sure. Partners. Yeah, I think people, you'll be surprised how many people are willing to help once they know what things are. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that most people are good people and most people want to do the right thing and want to do good things, um, despite what the news might lead you to believe. Um, and I think sometimes it's just, like you said, getting the word out, letting people know what you're trying to do. Um, and once people understand that and they see the, you know, they see the beauty in it and they see that the purpose of it, 
um, people are willing to help other people out for good causes. Um, I've seen it a bunch over the years. Um, yeah. we've, we've tried to do it as much as we can at the club, and I know other, other clubs do it. Um, so there are there are good natured people out there who you know want to contribute, want to help, um, because things like this are things at grassroots level that actually help things. Um, one of my one of our and everybody's frustrations is with with LA is that so much money gets spent and squandered and doesn't actually help the problem. Um, where this, something like this. Especially with the, that are so big, whether it be the governmental system or the nonprofit system, where they have so many different executives. Right, exactly. And all these people are getting it, all the money go all the money goes on bureaucracy and bullshit. And it doesn't yeah. it doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. But whereas when you see so things somebody like, like this, me, the one man show, even though of course I need to scale that out, but right. it's me and I'm directly with the kids. Me, yeah. I'm directly there. And I went to pol- and I went to school for politics, and I've always believed in a grassroots style of, style approach. Yeah. And so yeah. when someone donates money to the Kings of Weightlifting, thing, well, I'm at the Kings of Weightlifting, thing, so it's not like somebody else is there or yeah, something. it's not going to some huge organization and that money is getting filtered out yeah. across all these different people. It's going directly to the kids, basically. Yeah. You know. Um, and so we've, we've done weightlifting trips, we've done movies. Of course, the pandemic completely devastated us from fundraising efforts and being able to raise money so we can pay for a trip to the movie, a trip to Six Flags, go to the beach and go get something to eat. So that completely shut wow. us down. Here we are. We're, we're back rolling. And that's why I'm... So happy that you guys wanted to do this powerlifting competition to raise funds for the Kings of Weightlifting. Yeah, and and you know, I, and I hope this is the the first of many opportunities to help you out because, like like all business owners, we all have a you know we all have our frustrations with the way that things are, and you know, like I said, we all want to help society. We all want to do good things, and sometimes it's hard to know what to support, um, what's real. Um, what you know what organizations you can truly get behind and truly believe that you're you know the money is going to where you want it to go to and like i said before because you know now we know we know you and we know it's the direct thing it's kind of like a lot, really reassuring for me as, as a business owner to to really help like i said organizations where you know for a fact that you're really <laughs> helping someone that you you're directly yeah. helping and it's not that money's not not going um, and, it, somewhere it shouldn't, and it's just bringing attention, bringing attention directly to a good cause. Yeah. Some of these programs are really huge to where you, you have it, it's 10 levels of people that are at a company before it even gets to the kids. Like, yes, it, yes. For sure. Easy places. Yeah. Uh, what do you, um, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, what weightlifting and, and lifting weights in general is such an empowering thing for, for so many, for so many of us. Um, what do you think specifically about the Olympic lifting stuff that you're doing with the kids? How, why do you think it's so effective? What effect does it actually have on the, the community? So with the Olympic lifting and first and even going into that community, this is just something most kids weren't even familiar with. Right. But. Olympic lifting, because it has such a speed, power, and strength dynamic that you're able to also create athletes. And so now these elementary kids or middle school kids or even high school kids, now when they have recess at school, they're actually performing better because because it's explosive. Yeah, yeah. So it's transferring over to other actual quicker movements. And so now the kids that didn't want to do sprints, well, now that they're they actually want to do faster stuff. And so a lot of sports, soccer, football, basketball, these are quick twitch sports. Yeah. Olympic is a quick twitch, fast twitch sport. And so that's, I, I believe that's a big difference. Or even when I come and work with some of the kids that do boxing in that same area where they're, they're throwing strikes faster, they're throwing right. punches faster. Right. Because, uh, a lot of people are used to slower twitch stuff. They can do walks, longer walks, but especially with the obesity rate in the inner cities, 
a lot of kids by the time they're in fourth or fifth grade they're they can't even do many sports right right and so really yeah. depending and that that fast switch, which is how you actually get into wanting to play soccer, because yeah. if you're not used to doing those movements, you the kids that are actually fast and quick, you you won't have a shot. And so right. now you have to do this in a in a gym setting, hanging out, listening to music, talking, laughing, joking, but you're working on explosiveness. You're yeah, working it's, it's, on doing box jumps. Yeah, fun with it you're actually developing athletically right yeah there's a real high transference there um and it's funny because you know if you study any any kind of like periodization in sport kind of text or you know if you look at programming in general force for specific sports you know there's going to be a lot of stuff in there about explosiveness and um, dynamic effort and that kind of stuff um and what i love about this is Olympic lifting is hard to do if you don't have good coaches. Like you can't just look at a textbook and go and do a snatch. You know what I mean? You need good coaching. You need good technique. And obviously, if you don't have access to that, like the risk of the risk of injury, the risk of doing things badly is going to go up. People need access. People need access to, to good coaches, good equipment, and learning how to do things correctly. Um, and I'm sure you've seen it over the years. A lot of strength and conditioning coaches for sport are not that great <laughs> so I've, in most cases i've seen especially in high school and college i'll see some coach just hand a kid a sheet of paper and tell them this is today's workout right it's, it's these are advanced of, it's, and it's, it's such a dumbed down approach that the, the way they look at weightlifting or olympic weightlifting they have kids doing snatches cleaning jerks or whatever exercise hurting themselves squats they're not even squatting deep yeah and it's almost like it doesn't matter yeah it's 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 kind of a joke well not it's not funny it's not a funny joke but it's it's just kind of a mess that that, that happens and i you know I've, I've been shocked at what i've seen over the years um obviously i come from the uk um i saw a lot of like strength and conditioning for soccer players that was fucking awful a because it was just stuck in the dark ages and yeah. b just because the technique was fucking shocking um, and, and how, how would the athletes even know how to do it right. they're Entire life they've been handed a sheet of paper or email workout yeah yeah so i think the, the fact that you you're you know you're giving these kids access to you know someone who obviously knows what the fuck they're doing um, and they're going to learn how to do things well from a really young age you know that's just such a great benefit because you know you're 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 saving them from years of like mistakes and injury and all that all that kind of stuff whilst whilst also developing this, like we're talking about high transference to the whatever sport they're going to go into, you know, they may not become a weightlifter, but they're going to be able to use weightlifting skills in their sport that they're going into. And even with the Kings weightlifting, it's not even about becoming an Olympic weightlifter. Right. Well, it's about, they could learn, of course, Olympic weightlifting, they could become trainers, they could become chiropractors. We do all these prehab exercises. Mm. We do core activation, glute activation. Yeah. We we do dodgeball because we're still working on being quick. Yeah. We do basketball. So we're doing all these different things. Weightlifting is just. Yeah. That's just the expression. Like and also it's, it's just on, on a simpler level, it's just teaching a discipline, right? Whether it's Olympic lifting, whether it's BJJ, whatever it is, like yeah. kids, kids need discipline and they need to something to focus their energy on. And I yeah. think so many problems are arising from, you know, kids not doing sport, kids not being active, kids just playing computer games and, you know, staying inside all the time, not getting out and doing things. Yeah. Um, so the more that we can, you know, push them into like some kind of sport yeah. or some kind of area that's going to give him the A, activity, B, discipline, C, focus, all these things um, is going to be hugely beneficial for their, for their development. Um, you know, we, we moved... Me and Emily moved to Idlewild with, with Wyatt. And one of the primary reasons for that was I wanted him to be outside more uh, and not get caught up in the, you know, the technology and the, the computer and all that. Kind of stuff. Not that he doesn't watch his iPad and not that he doesn't watch TV because he does, but he yeah. doesn't do it all the time. Like it's, it's, it's part of his life, but yeah. he's outside a lot. He's doing things a lot. He's very active a lot. Um, but age and, will he have his own bone? Right. Oh, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to. <laughs> Keep it off them as long as I can, but um, but I when I when I moved here, like I went to the school and I said because there's a there's a there's an art college down the 
down the street and there's another school. And it's like, you know, what kind of, what kind of PE, what kind of phys ed programs do they have? And honestly, next to nothing, next to nothing. And I'm like, you wonder why like so many kids have so many problems, like attention wise. It's like, they need to be physical. They need to be doing something. You have to. Burn up. You have to. Just for your mental health, you need to be physically burning off. You do, you do. I mean, I, I know when I when I was growing up, like we did some kind of like physical game stuff every every day. I mean, I was like I was very active as a kid anyway, so I was like I was in all the teams like cross country and football and all this kind of stuff. But you know, there would be something uh, something you would do every day, and now it just seems like it's such an afterthought. Like maybe you do PE once a week, maybe, and even then you don't have to. You your parents can say, oh, he can't do it because he's got some like some fucking made up excuse. Yeah. It's just, well, it's just so frustrating to see because it, it seems to be the problem is so simple. Give them healthy nutrition and give them activity. But the solution is no, 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 no. Let's give them some, you know, ADA uh, drugs. Let's give them some, some medication. And let's, give them, let's give them an excuse and let's, you know. Hook them early. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm not exaggerating when I say fourth or fifth grade you could almost see who's going to be physically inactive. Right. Did that soon. And, and even where I'm the, where the program is loaded, located in the inner city of Los Angeles, about 50% of the kids are, are overweight. Right. And right. so close to half or almost pre-diabetic or diabetic. The funding for the physical education has been cut in the school drastically. That was the first thing that got cut. Yeah. Um, Which is typical, you know. The, the parents are lower income, working multiple jobs. So the kids are at home by themselves. Yeah. And then the, the phone with everything, all the instant gratification that you can get yeah. on the, all throughout the day. Why would you work out? Yeah. If you're yeah. happy with this thing in your face. Yeah. Even at times we'll have kids come in the gym and they'll be on the phone. They, no, 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 let's cut this. Uh, let's yeah, that yeah. Down. This is a yeah, phone yeah. Free room now. <laughs> yeah. It's getting ridiculous. Yeah, it's a real issue. It's a real issue. You know, you know, we just have to keep working, doing everything we can to, to yeah. you know, make activity but, a priority. And, and the nutritional part of it is huge as well. And I'm sure, I'm sure you deal with some of that as well at your place. Oh, it's, just, it's candy, it's chips, it's, it's yeah. sodas. Uh, it, it, no, it's funny. It's kind of how I grew up. I remember when I was growing up in the inner city, we would have flaming hot Cheetos and a soda for lunch. That was lunch. Yeah. yeah. You have cereal with sugar in it for breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so. So I think now, like in this time, we are seeing like the repercussions of everything that's been building up for the last 30 years, you know, it's, and it's getting, it's, it's getting worse, but I do think now finally there is like this big awareness around this needs to fucking stop. This needs to change because as a human race, we are just destroying ourselves with all this, with all this shit. Um, yeah. And it's been going on for too long. Um, it's been getting worse and worse. And like you just mentioned the, the obesity rates are, are awful um at, at, like you're saying like at a very young age you know to have kids so young already obese is just so yeah. fucking shocking um, and you know it's you know people people want to blame the parents but it's it's just so hard like you said some of these parents are working two or three jobs you know just to make ends meet they can't be there all the time to supervise the kids and when the kids are just inundated with this like advertisement and marketing of like junk food and it's just all around them and it's just so convenient it's so fucking cheap and these companies it's, directly target them directly target them and they know exactly, exactly what they're doing but yeah. they never had they're never held accountable for it they never get in trouble nope. it's just you know it's just a mess so yeah all we can all we can, all we can do is you know keep trying to like get the right message through try, try keep try keep trying to raise awareness on these things yeah. and try and push these kids in the in the right direction because then we have conversations about sugar. We have conversations about carbs, meat. Yeah. We, I, yeah. I do a, more of an anti-inflammatory, low-carb style diet. That's what got me off a decade of, from the age of 17 to 27, I was on 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, Vicodin, painkillers, sleeping yeah. pills, 
to, to deal with being an athlete and my nutrition mm. from, from that point and from being a kid up until that point. Yeah. Even even though I had a six pack, it was yeah. still in flame. That st- right, just, right, right, right. Yeah, there's the t- a big difference. There's a big difference to what's going on the outside to what's going on on the inside. You know. Yeah. And, and so just learning that and, and spreading that message. So we're having conversations about nutrition. We have conversations about dental health. You, you see kids with the caps on their teeth from the the, the cavities and the sugar. Right. Well, we have conversations about that. Yeah. Now we can discuss the nutrition. So it all. To me, physical, mental, nutrition, it's all the same. It's, it's all just health. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all health. Um, yeah. It's all it's all it's all healthy, healthy, healthy bodies, but also healthy minds. You have to have to build healthy minds in these in these kids. Um, because like we said before, there's just so much, there's so much negativity and there's so much bullshit, and there's so much um, there's so much bad information out there. Um we, we need organizations like this to, to show them the good stuff, you know, to show them, you know, the brighter side of things and the, the joy that you can get from uh, a discipline and the joy that you can get from physical exercise and the, and, the, and the mental health you can get from eating good food and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, I feel like if organizations like this, like your organization isn't doing it and, and gyms like Barris isn't doing it in some, in some capacity, then who's fucking doing it? Because it's not coming from the government, I tell you that. that's that's obvious to see. Um, Even with these, a lot of these programs, I've just the food that they're serving. Right, they do get kids, whether it be an after-school program. You see the food, you say, "Whoo, yeah." It's reinforcing the nutrient already eating is yeah, so even this even this. Even this recent push now to, but, but towards like chemical man-made meat-free foods. It's like, what the fuck are you doing to these kids? It's, it's to, to tell them that this chemically engineered uh, food is going to be better for you than eating real food is, is the answer to the world's problems. It's like, what the fuck I've had so many conversations about that in the last two years that I don't really have anything else to say about it. I'm right. always telling people if a restaurant if i went to a restaurant and they gave me 90 percent meat and the 10 percent was chemically engineered i said i'm not eating eating that right so you could eat 100 percent chemically engineered <laughs> yeah i remember there yeah. it was i'm not going to mention their name but there was this fast food chain and they're of course they're global they're huge yeah and we found out a decade ago or so that 40 percent of their meat that 40% of their meat, 40% of their items were meat and the 60% was chemically engineered. Right. People, had, people were outraged 15, 20 years ago. Right. Now we have meatless meat. Right, <laughs> right. Now yeah. it's- It's I, wild. I, I, I don't know. And it's what's wild is how much they try and like normalize it and make it seem like it's the best thing to do and it's the best thing for them. And it's all fucking bullshit. And it's all, you know, it's all, it's just follow follow the money trail. See who's making money from this, you know? It's Bill Gates, I'll give you a clue, but. <laughs> you, know I mean? um, you know, this is, this is politics and this is yeah, all it's stuff cool. I've studied just for forever. And it just, it, 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 it's crazy that that's even allowed. Yeah, it's crazy that it's allowed. It's crazy. Uh, it's just mm-hmm. wild. Um, Derek, let, let's go back. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the kinds of weightlifting thing. We, we've got that down about what, what it is and what the purpose is. I want to know more about you. Um, how did you, you mention, you know, your upbringing and you, you, you had access to a weightlifting, uh, you know, a charitable weightlifting organization when you were young. If people don't know your journey, can you tell us a little bit about your journey as an athlete? So my journey as an athlete, I was a kid that just absolutely loves sports from an early age. If I saw it on TV, I would go out and practice it. And I would put in just however many hours I had to put in to be the best at it. If it was basketball, I had the best dribble. I had the best shot. I would study Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Whatever the sport was, if the track and field was on, I would go out there and practice my track running skills, football. So I just love athletics. I just love the thought of being wanting to be an athlete. 
so it's funny, and I've told this story a, a, a few different times, just from like my journey. So I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri has been, especially the inner city, has been known as the deadliest city in the United States just for decades. We, I grew up doing the crack epidemic in the United States. And so that means my neighborhood was filled with gangs. My, the, the, the house I lived, the neighborhood I lived in, my house was shot up in the drive by and, and when I was in fourth grade. There were there were drug raids happening often on my block, and so that was that was the background of everything happening. If you you had to either be a crip or a blood to be in my neighborhood to be a, a black boy growing up in the inner city, and so typically boys like me would, would join a gang, especially if you're from a neighborhood like this. But me, I just wanted to be an athlete. Right. That I would let anything stop me even though my friends family members were in gangs and so basketball was just my first love there and I always wanted to get stronger uh but it really wasn't my weightlifting journey doesn't really start for me wanting to be a weightlifter or an athlete it was really to try to survive physical abuse right in outside the home and so that's how I always wanted to get stronger I was doing sit-ups so I had this neighbor who used to go to this gym as a kid and he would tell me about it. And so for six months, I begged him, I pleaded, oh, please take me to this. He's, he's told all these stories about going on this on these trips. He's told these stories about having these huge trophies and medals. Well, I wanna be an athlete, so I need to be at whatever this gym is you're talking about. And so I begged him for six months to the point where I stopped begging him because he's not going to take me, but I'm doing push-ups every night. I'm doing sit-ups every night. I'm playing basketball. I'm jumping. I am, I have to do this on my own then. One day he, I come home from school in sixth grade. He tells me, hey, uh, I want to take you to this gym because I already, I have a six pack now. <laughs> I'm 11 years old with a six pack. Also, right. I'll say that he was a six foot tall guy, 225 pounds with a six pack. And so he looked like an NFL running back. Right, right, right. So we were just looking at him as kids, my cousin and I, and we said, man, I want to look like this guy. <laughs> yeah. And he was just chiseled. Yeah. And so that's what made us start doing push ups and sit ups. And so by the time I come into this gym six months later, I'm shredded. <laughs> in sixth grade i'm shredded wow. and i remember at the beginning i didn't have any muscle tone i didn't want to stand next to him because and he was about he was probably 18 years old so he was he had, had all those years of training behind him um and so I, I instantly stood out the first day i went into the gym and so i had my workout we played basketball in there and, and that was the start and so I would start doing Olympic weightlifting for two or three months. But then, and then that same, this is the beginning of my sixth grade year, also made the basketball team. Mm. So I was a sixth grader, one of two sixth graders that made the basketball team. And all the basketball players were mostly eighth graders. Wow. And so that was to show you my level of basketball skill. Yeah. Um, and I actually quit weightlifting and I quit basketball because I started working. So I started working all these different jobs. I was working in warehouses. I was working at restaurants. And so one of the jobs I had was working at a hundred house, was working at a restaurant. So in sixth grade, I was working 40 hours a week. I would work a 14 hour shift on Sunday. And it was because I didn't have money. We, we were living off food stamps. We were food insecure in my house, which is why a lot of the kids the, the part that's missing when, when they talk about kids joining gangs, well, you have nothing to eat. Right. And so you're this kid, whether you're a kid in the, the, the area where the Kings of Wadleton is, or you're a kid in the inner city where I grew up in St. Louis, there's, and I'm not exaggerating, you open a refrigerator, there's nothing to eat. And so now these kids are, me, I had to try to be creative. I, I want to be this athlete. I am dead set. I'm locked in on being an athlete. Most of my friends are selling drugs. Mm. Uh, 
and I personally have seen them from the eighth when I was in fourth grade through sixth grade. I had a dozen friend, a dozen friends killed or locked up. Wow! So that was just the life. That was just yeah. regular yeah. life. And so all of these kids are in the gangs in the first place to sell drugs to have protection. And I'm not making any. I'm not co-signing any of this behavior. And I'm just telling you. Yeah, no, but I, I but I think a lot, of, gets- a lot of a lot of people judge without understanding the desperation. You know what I mean? Like you said, people haven't got anything to fucking eat. Like- and so I'm explaining the, the level of desperation. Yeah, yeah. The level of why gangs are going to be around as long as poverty, totally. as long as is, is around as long as you open the refrigerator and there's nothing to eat in there when you go to bed and, and, and rats and roaches are crawling around the entire house so that's the background of what you see a lot of these kids come from and, and myself come from and, and so this is so now so I, i'm this is sixth grade beginning of sixth grade everything i love basketball weightlifting i quit them both i'm working 40 hours a week uh, the second semester of sixth grade, I'm working from 11 a.m. to 1.30 in the morning on Sundays. I work an eight-hour shift on Friday and Saturday night. So I, I can't even get into trouble because I'm at work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that was kind of what kept me focused. Why, why do you think you were so different from the other kids? What Was, did you, was it a role, role model? Was it a... Um, I, th- I think at that point, yeah, I, I would go study. And I know a lot of kids love, we all love athletes. We all love people like Michael Jordan or Kobe when I was when later on. But I would go to the library and I love reading too. At that, I love being, I love competing. So I wanted to be the best kid in class, even in fourth, fifth grade. I wanted to be the best student in class. Mm-hmm. And I want to be the best athlete in class. So I don't know if it was something. Just in you. So something, it sounds like a yeah. genetic thing. You were just like yeah, so that way inclined. Uh, and of course, life got in the way. I remember seventh, eighth grade. I was, because I would be exhausted. I would sometimes yeah. get home at, I would get home at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I'm sorry, Monday morning. And, you know, school, you have to get ready for school at 6 a.m. I would sometimes not get to bed until 3 a.m. Wow. And so even though my friends could make the money that I was making in 40 hours, they could make the money in one hour from standing on the corner selling drugs. It would take me 40. But I knew to be an athlete, I had to go this way. I knew I thought those was was the best options. And so by being by starting working that early in sixth grade, 12 years, even now I have 25 years of work experience. And so that gave, and I, and I realized that more and more now that it gave me more just work experience. For of sure. course, I didn't have time to be spending weekends with friends and, and things like that, but it put me into a professional mode because at the jobs I worked, I worked with adults. Yeah. I would really be the only kid in, in these places. And so the, most of the workers were 20, 30 year olds, 40 year olds. Right. And so by sixth grade, I'm doing all these different tasks. I'm a carpenter. I'm doing landscaping. I'm working at warehouses. I'm working with, at, at fundraisers. So dozens of different skills I'm picking up in yeah. addition to the physical skills that I'm picking up because I love just about every sport. I watch baseball. I watch hockey. I just have a curiosity of everything and i think that's what gets me there i would read a lot of books by malcolm x i was just absolutely fascinated with malcolm x and so by reading him i knew i knew his past of what he used to do and what he was saying okay what he was doing as a man so i would try to follow that lead there yeah yeah and so i I think really studying these these athletes and politicians always had a fascination for yeah uh, but it, it, it's you know I talk about this a lot of work. You, you had an incredible work ethic from a from a young age, and like you said, as bad as the situation was, it forced you into all these situations that gave you all this experience, gave you all this knowledge, gave you all yeah. this real world. This is how the world works, kind of experience. Yeah, you know, and, and- it, it's hard right now because a lot of people come into jobs or come into interviews with so much entitlement 
because they haven't had that background. They haven't been through that. They haven't had that work experience. They haven't had those situations. So you were by a young age, a lot more grounded than most, you know, because well, imagine, imagine you graduate from college and you're 22 years old where really you don't have any work experience. Right. But by 22, I had 10 years of work experience. Right. And so it just made me, it, I, I don't know, maybe I was already a high performance person, which is why I started working, but it definitely turned me into a high performance person. And so there I was in the inner city, an all black inner city. And so now at the restaurants I was working at the, a, a lot of the waiters and the staffs were white. And so now I was getting diversity. I was learning things from them. I was, even though I was not too far from home, but I was getting a, this outlook from people that were lived in the suburbs that came down to this restaurant or came down to the store I was working at. So it was the, the volunteers would come to the gym, the, the gym, I would become the first kid to win the 16 and under national championships the 20 and under national championships, the senior national championships, collegiate national. So all this would bring visitors. We would have all these, we had Super Bowl champions coming to the gym now. We had Colin Powell. He was the first joint chief of staff for the yeah. United States. I'm sorry, the first African-American joint chief yeah. of staff. He became the first secretary of the Secretary of Defense for the United States, the highest ranking black politician in United States history until Barack Obama became president. And so he had came to the gym twice. He had came in 1999 when I was in ninth grade, met him, hung out with him. He came back again when I was in college for my political science degree. So he's come back twice. He never, and, and the gym was in the inner city. The gym was across the street from a liquor store, uh, a, a crack house and a like a housing project. So this is not this is the area that most Americans won't even go to. Yeah. Colin yeah. Powell has been here twice. Wow. You're talking about even so he came when I was in ninth grade. Do you know that when I went to college, I already knew that I was going to graduate with a political science degree. I was that charged. I was right. That right. That's great. When we talk about the Kings of Wayla thing. It's I'm, I'm giving stories like this. And so if I can inspire someone and to be inspired, you really need to be, you need to have some contact with you do. someone that yeah. inspires you. Because a lot a of people, bit, older. you need, like, you need icons. You need, um, you know, people to look, to look up to, people to aspire to be, and you need a little bit of hope. You need to understand that, that there is hope. You can, you can make a better life for yourself. It's, it's, it's possible. Because a lot of these people, I think, you know, if, if you're in bad situations, it can seem hopeless. And once you give up hope and everything seems kind of like pointless, you will turn to, you know, yeah. you will turn to, to, to crime or to yeah. gang, no, or whatever, no, no. whatever it is to get out of the situation that you're in because it seems hopeless. Yeah. No, and, and, that, and, and those conditions completely, and I can speak of family members and friends I've grown up with. I've even had, Right now, I've had a, I've had dozen over three dozen friends killed from gun violence in, in St. Louis, wow. and so you, you're growing up with all these different things. And me, I was just laser focused, just for a long time. But if you <laughs> were someone trying to figure it out, all these things, th these are major traumas that make you lose hope. Yes. The poverty that you have inside your home, that makes you lose hope. The violence outside of your home, maybe the violence inside your home as well, these all make you lose hope. The schools, mm -hmm. most schools in the inner cities are, are ranked one out of 10. So even your, your chance of upward mobility is, is lower in the inner city because of the school system as well. Yeah, A lot of these places are food deserts. So now you're not even being fueled off the, off the best yeah 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 to even balance you that way and so it's just a lot of landmines that you're that you're walking across or, or that you're trying to avoid well there's there's just so much working against you there's so many there's so many reasons to fail i guess is yeah. the way to put it but your relentlessness to succeed you know push you forward um and, and so, you, so I, I just wanted to ask because i just missed how did you go from the part where you were just like working so many hours? How did you find your way back into fitness? 
so because at first I would work <laughs> I would work so many different jobs I remember at one point I had a job where I was working at the school I think I would go from four to six so that would be Monday through Friday then I had a job where I was working on the weekend and so when the job ended the first semester of sixth grade, I no longer had that Monday through Thursday job. Mm. And so now that opened it back up for me to do weightlifting. So that's when I come back to weightlifting the, the middle of sixth, near the end of sixth grade. And so now I'm able to go to North Carolina and compete at the AAU Junior Olympics. And so now I haven't, I've not even been outside of my city. This is sixth grade. I haven't been outside oh, wow. St. Louis city. And so now I'm in North Carolina and we're, we, we took a van. It was about 30 kids and we're in these 15 passenger vans. And I'm looking at all these different states. And so now I'm just imagining, I'm, I'm dreaming. Is this like when, is this what this like when athletes are traveling to all these different arenas? I feel like I'm a, I'm a athlete now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm traveling, I have my bag. I'm going to this competition, I'm getting a medal. And, and now I'm consistent. Now the 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 re, now I just have the restaurant job. So at that point, I'm really just at the restaurant most weekends, Friday through Friday through Sunday. And I'm getting about 35 hours there from Friday 4 p.m. to right. uh, I go back to school Monday. And so now I just don't have a time. I don't have the time to get into trouble. All right. my other time is is dedicated to schoolwork because you have to be there. It's dedicated to be an athlete because I'm going to be an athlete. And guess what? Time to work again. And so now I'm avoiding a lot of the things that kids yeah. are, are getting into because they're at home. They're constantly sitting in that hopeless situation me i'm talking to all these different people at, at work i sometimes I'm, I'm peeling potatoes i'm peeling apples i'm uh, i'm the dishwasher they let me sub in one day i'm cooking chicken i'm cooking brunch i'm scrubbing pots i'm mopping floors i'm serving the so all these different different things that they're allowing me to do because i find it to be i don't know better than sitting at home Right. And presumably, yeah. presumably, once you got that first medal under your belt, that was like pouring gasoline on the fire, right? Uh, From there it was like. Yeah. And I was just my best cheerleader. I'm just having yeah. the best conversations with myself. This is you. And, and all these different the medals represented me being on the on the right step because I was living a life where it was just you go to school with holes in your clothes, you you go to sleep hungry. Your, your house just got shot up in the drive-by. The drug raids are happening. Police are, are swarming around. Gangs are all around. So all these different things you're avoiding. And this, you, you, your cousin just got killed. Your, your friend just went to jail. I remember in, in sixth grade, one of my, my neighborhood friends, and we would play fifth grade, sixth grade, and, and I started working. So I wasn't really able to... to I just didn't have that time anymore. And one day, this gang, they, they, they drove by his house. They shot and killed his mother. Oh. And, and I remember I heard about it. I just didn't even have an emotional response to it because that's all that was happening. Yeah. That's just what happens there. Yeah, you just get desensitized to it. And, and now you're desensitized. Now there's no... That's what life is. And so all these different things make kids lose hope. And every single medal I was getting, every single trip we were going on, we would have these waves and competitions. After the competitions, we would go to restaurants and eat. I had never been in a sit-down restaurant. Right. This is sixth, seventh grade. I had never been in a six. I had never sat down to eat at a restaurant. So all I'm I'm so now. You know, this is is misery surrounding everything around me. I'm winning medals now. I can look at my arms. I can go into the, the gym and I can keep pumping and I keep seeing definition, muscle definition, because fifth grade, I didn't have it. And I was desperate for a six pack. So yeah. now I see how my body looks. I see the medals now. 
I'm in North Carolina now. Then the next year we went somewhere else. When we went somewhere else, and then we went out, we were going all over the Midwest. Then we started going around, just around the country. And so now I have a little money in my pocket. So my clothing looks better. I'm not getting talked about in school. Um, I'm able to buy something if I'm hungry. Things are improving. It's not right. ideal. Well, actually, uh -huh. I don't know how the kids are living. I, I know how I'm living. I know how yeah. people that are in my neighborhood are living. So I'm seeing improvement. Ninth grade, we have Colin Powell in there. So that makes me study him even more. Uh, we have the Ram the St. Louis Rams football players, which, of course, moved to Los Angeles now. Right. But we have St. Louis Rams there. I'm seeing the football players that millions of people watch coming to, to the gym that I work out at. Then and also in high school, we have Marshall Falk, who is now a Hall of Fame mm. NFL football player. He's at the gym. You got to wow. be kidding me. Yeah. And so I'm this athlete and I win. The, and, I, and, and at 16, I win the 16 and under national championships. I get invited to the Marshall Falk Foundation dinner. At that dinner, I'm meeting Los Angeles Lakers football players. I'm sorry, Los Angeles Lakers basketball players. I'm meeting all these football players from all these different teams from all around the country. We're all in the same building. Wow. I'm meeting comedians, actors, they're in the building. They have me get up on stage and talk about this award I've won because Marshall Falk is now a sponsor of the gym that I go to. And so it's just like, what is going on here? because I just continued to keep going. I used every single medal as like a Christmas present. And so even from, I wasn't even getting Christmas or birthday gifts. On Thanksgiving, a lot of the times we wouldn't even have turkeys. Right. And so you're, you're just, cert, just, the medal is competing sports. So I have that and it, and it, it it's, you know, like you, you, you get a PR. Yeah. You see progress. Yeah. So I'm seeing progress from all these different things I'm doing. I know as a sixth grader that I can beat most of these eighth graders. I can beat most eighth, ninth graders. I know in seventh or eighth grade, I'm going to some camp, some basketball camps at St. Louis University. And even though I'm undersized, I think I'm the best basketball player at this camp. So all, all these things. So I know because I'm putting in hours when I have this time. So I know, OK, I go to work at 11 a.m. on Sunday at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. I need to be up getting some shots in because I can't play anymore today. And so in sixth grade, I'm making plans out like this. Like, OK, we have to be here at this time. And I'm not showing up late. I'm showing up on before I need to be there at work. Right. Because if, if, if I lose this job, I have to probably wait till I'm 16 years old before I can legally get a, a, a permit to work. So that's another thing that I'm looking at as well. I know if I'm not getting these jobs, I have to wait to 16. So that hurts a lot of kids as well. Even if a kid wanted to get a job, most places won't, 99.9% .9 of the places won't hire them. Um, and so, yeah. And so that's how I get at the restaurant which is the same owner as the haunted house I worked at in. Right. And I got, I got the job at the haunted house and, and that's only through the Halloween season, but I got the, the, the job at the haunted house, which is the same owner as the restaurant that I'm, yeah. that I would go work out at. Uh, the job I had Monday through Thursday was ending. And so I needed a new job because there's no other options of making money and, yeah, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to make money. I go to the haunted house and I see the, I find out who the owner is. The owner is actually there. He's like working tickets or something. Um, and I talk to him and I'm and I'm I'm desperately trying to get a job. And I have my cousin with him, cousin with me. He's in sixth grade also. And I'm talking. I probably talk for an hour and a half. <laughs> I don't get the job. I don't get the job. So we leave, okay. And, and it was just by chance because I need, I need the job to be able to even finance, to even be able to play sports. It's just, right. you can't, 
that just won't be possible. And so it was actually a desperate situation. So I sleep over my cousin's house that I was with at the haunted house. His older brother steals my money. Ugh. And this is just, this is just unbelievable. So I have no money, just no money. I don't know how I'm going to buy food, buy clothing. I'm paying for my haircuts. So anything that I need to buy, anything that I, it, it, it has to come for me. I go back to the haunted house the next night. I see the owner of the, the haunted house again. I probably talked to him for two hours and was hired. <laughs> what was so the job? Like that, like a persistence. I didn't know. Yeah, well, that's just credit to you, man. But if you've been persistent. And I don't know like, why I did that. I, I just don't. Well, I know why I did it because it. You needed it. You had, I, I had no choice. It. I had yeah. no choice. And maybe that's why I'm an entrepreneur. Maybe that's why. Yeah. I, yeah, because you have to be comfortable with, with asking and, and going out there and, yeah. and, and persistent. So all these things I'm learning. So even by the age of, so by the age of 24, I create this collegiate wisdom program. It's the first program in the world that gives out scholarships to weightlifters from all around the world. Mm. It's still the only program like that now. And so that's how I'm able to become the youngest uh, level five coach in USA weighted in history. Um, and even at 19 years old, I would start coaching at the same program that I started weightlifting at as a kid. And we would, we were just winning quickly and making waves fast wow. that by the age of what age of 21, I was winning national titles as an athlete and having my athletes win national titles in their younger age divisions. Wow. And so that was just in their early 20s. And it was just all these years of work, work experience, leadership. That yeah. at the time, I can't believe this. Then you look back and say, oh, well, I was all what these was it, What was it like? What was it like making that transition from athlete to coach? Well, I've always been an athlete and a coach. Yeah. I'm an athlete coach now. Yeah. So I've never, I've, I've been an athlete. Never not been one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So since 2004, I've been an athlete and coach. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand when you're talking about trying to make money because a lot, a lot of people seem to think like once you're a, a competing athlete, which you were, that there's some kind of like financial package behind that. But unfortunately, weightlifting is one of those sports where, you know, there isn't much money in it, right? Yeah. And, and, and mine because it's always been like this. I've always been a weightlifter and working for the past 25 years or entrepreneur, however you want to say it. Right. Uh, so I've always had the, the, the sponsors. I've always partnered with companies. I would do my coaching seminars. my So monetizing it that way. Right. Which is how, if you want to be an Olympian in a sport, if you want to be an Olympian in a sport outside of basketball and really basketball, you, you need to be able to make these partnerships. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You need so, to, uh... if, so if you're able to make these partnerships, you can have a 20 year career, a 25 year career. And the ones that can't make the partnerships, well, they have to stop. They have to give up something they love. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, like you said, you learn how to hustle from such a young age in a, in a good way, like an entrepreneurial yeah. hustle. Yeah. Um, you know, that helped you, you know, set up all these, all these things and able to like know how to, how to draw finance in and support these, you know, support well, these well imagine, right. imagine how many people as an entrepreneur, even with the Kings of weightlifting, I have to be comfortable with sending a thousand emails and right. getting funds and yeah. still send another thousand. Right. Right. I, it was funny. I had one year where I was, I had graduated college. This is like in 2009. And I was like a, lo a loan officer for homes. And you make all, you have this call sheet where you make all these calls. You have to be comfortable. Well, you have to be a salesman. You have to be yeah. comfortable with making a thousand cold calls and having a hundred people hang up before you get someone to talk to you. And I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. They are. And a lot of people will give up at the first failure. Whereas, you know, you get so 
used to failure or yeah, used to failure like, is fine. you get so used to rejection you know what's wrong with failure and rejection there's nothing right. wrong with that right right you, you have to live in a magical world where you think 100 percent of what you do is going to succeed which is how and i think that's where social media with the kids always having their phone in their hand they see right. this magical perfect world right that's that's just yeah. not realistic not reality. yeah if yeah that's just not realistic. And, and so yeah. I had all these these failures growing up where it was just, you're surrounded by failure that is like, okay, well, let's see what we can do. We got nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it made you so resilient and so, you know, so able to deal with all these situations, you know, because you'd been through so much already that yeah. you, you already had this suit of armor, you know? Yeah, because I, I look back on things and I say, wow, I, because I wasn't embarrassed to go talk to him for the first hour. Literally, that the hunting house, the owner of the hunting house who owns the restaurant, I talked to him two hours that first night. The whole the whole entire two hours, I was pitching him, pitching him on hiring me and my cousin, who was also 12 years old. Right. And so we're just not legally old enough to work. And then right. the next night, I come back, another two hour pitch from kids that are not legally old enough to work. And as the hunted house, as the Halloween season was ended, we would of course learn that he had a restaurant, pitching him on getting us to the restaurant. So I don't know, it was just, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I know why I needed to do it, but I guess I just had enough courage to do it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so if younger people or entrepreneurs are listening, you have to you have to be okay with failure, the rejections, and, and keep staying locked in on the mission. Yeah. And also because like, you know, it's given you such a sense of purpose because you, you know, you did go through so much and you had so much, you know, so much stress that would have you know, would have affected other people in a, in a far more negative way, but everything, everything that happened to you turned into a positive. Uh, you learn from it, you continue to push forward, you continue to grow. Uh, and that's given you such a strong sense of like self and purpose that, you know, it's, it's always that it's always the, you know, always the journey that, um, that gives you the, the tools you need to, to arrive at this kind of destination you are now of like the person you are, that's able to like do this for other people and help other people come through and have the tools, the wherewithal, the, you know, the experience, the ambition, the knowledge to make it happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, all credit to you um, for everything you've, you've accomplished, but um, it's just always amazing to hear these, these stories and personalities like you that, that come out of these terrible situations, but are able to do something incredible with it. Um, it's always very inspiring to me. Yeah, uh, and those were a lot of the people that I was. It, it's funny. I'm not sure if you're familiar with football and Marshall Falk. Yeah. In elementary, I had I would have a folder, and Marshall Falk was on it. Right. Because Marshall Falk came from New Orleans. He came from a housing right. project. He came from welfare, and so I knew his story. And so yeah. it was somebody that one of the most violent cities in in America. He came from New Orleans especially at that time and it's like okay i see he's in here with me okay this is right. how he looks this is how he talks this is so i had all these it was just right there and that's what i try to bring to the to the kings of weightlifting where sometimes we don't even lift weights we just right. have yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a mentality it's a mentality of like if they can do it i can do it as a because there, there are a million reasons to fail but there's also reasons to succeed. And when you, like you said, when you have an icon like that, it just gives you that glimmer of hope. And like you had, you know, you follow that glimmer and then you have these like little positive experiences along the way. And then you win your first medal. And then, you know, it's, it's a catalyst, but you need these still, these little yeah, things. Yeah, you just need something to. Yeah. Night to, on to, to inspire you to, yeah. 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 Um... Um, what was it, what was it what was your experience like representing the USA as a weightlifter? So 16 years old, this is 2001. I'm I'm at the Marshall Falk football dinner. 
I'm seeing some of my favorite celebrities and athletes. The next day I play, I play football, 18 holes, 16, 18 holes with Warwick Dunn, uh, a running back in the NFL. He played 10 years. Mm. Uh, then after that, I'm sorry, let's reverse. Actually, months before that, I represent the United States in Canada. Now I have a passport. Mm. I mean, I am just mentally on fire. There is nothing that can stop me at this point. I am. I have. The, I have on the red, white, and blue. Remember, I've been training in the inner city, across the street from a liquor store, a, right. a crack house, and just chaos is happening in the gym and and, and where I live. I win this 16 and under national title. I move on to Canada to represent the United States. I'm there. Then, then months after that, I go to Marshall Falls. So all this has happened in 2001. I mean, I'm just mentally on fire now. I know that I want to be a weightlifter. I, I have seen enough. Right. The jury doesn't need to deliberate anymore. <laughs> I, I, it's yeah. a done deal now. And so that year really... I really thought I would be a weightlifter that year. Yeah. I, I know I love basketball. I know I love football. I was a, in, in my freshman year of high school, I was a varsity. I made, I was on varsity wrestling. So I was really, I was probably, I probably could have definitely been a D1 wrestler. Right. A D1 basketball player, even being shorter. <laughs> um, but 2001, I knew. And it was that Canada trip, that passport, me, somebody, that's what I was thinking at that time. Somebody like me, I have a passport. Yeah. Years before that, I wasn't even get, getting out of this neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, and it's things like that that so many people take for granted. And for you, it was such a, such a moment, right? Such a, such a, such a grand moment. Um, what would you say? Because obviously from there, you went on to win multiple medals yeah so i've won 30 i've won over 30 national and international titles uh, i've won gold medals in iran puerto rico where else at uh, some <laughs> different places yeah yeah what would um, you what would you say was has been the real like highlights of your career because obviously there's so many things you could like point to but yeah uh, so throughout this process i had two knee surgeries at 19 years old and so at that point I said, ah, and I was, I was doing everything possible to avoid the knee surgery because I'm in the sport of weightlifting. We squat a lot. Right. Right. <laughs> Almost all squatting. And imagine you have this damaged knee that you're trying to squat in. I keep getting cortisone injections in both knees. I'm getting cortisone injections in my back. I'm taking all these painkillers, the 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. So I've just been dealing with this for a while since I first hyperextended my knee in my junior year of basketball, a non-contact basketball drill. And so now I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of the inner city now? What is going on? And of course, I was a, I love school. So, uh, yeah, so I was definitely always studying politicians, Malcolm X. Right. And I, I knew I needed to do, be good at that. Uh, but still, I, I just wanted to be an athlete. So at 19, I have these two knee surgeries. And I'm thinking, okay, it's not too much longer. I'm, I'm going to be lifting. Right. Uh, came back from that, won some titles. 2011, I had another knee surgery. So the first two, the, the first knee sur two knee surgeries at 19 was about two years before the 2008 Olympics, year and a half. Then I had another knee surgery about a year and a half uh, again before the 2012 Olympics. I'm like, what is going on here? And I'm thinking, okay, well, it's probably not going to be too much longer. Uh, then in the last 10 years, I switched to an anti-inflammatory style of eating when I moved to Los Angeles. Actually, next, next week makes 10 years of living here. And so I moved to Santa Monica and Santa Monica, is, which is where I live now also. And it just really health conscious. So I started learning about nutrition more. Mm. And so I made all these different changes nutritionally that it took the inflammation off, off of my joints. Wow. 
And so from there, I won the 2013 national championships after probably thinking my career was over prior to moving to LA. I didn't wow. move to LA originally continue to compete. It was only because I made changes and my body felt good that I said, you know, I was always training, but not, I just wasn't going to compete. And I made these changes and I eliminated all chemicals, all over the counter medications, all painkillers gone within a week of switching to this style of eating. And I remember I started in February of 2013. I watched that Super Bowl and I said, okay, tomorrow I, I have enough information. I guess I'm going keto. Here we go. Well, is that what you did? You went keto? Yeah. Wow. And so I got the inflammation off my joints, started healing my GI tract. Uh, I was already at that point going to bed. At, I would unplug all the electronics from the room. My room was completely blacked out. I had to relearn how to eat. I had to relearn how to sleep and sleep by at least 1030, lights off at 10, all the electronics unplugged at 10. And I won the 2013 Senior Nationals. I took a shot at an American record. The next competition, I won the 2013 American Open. The next competition, 2014, at 29 years old, I broke my first ever Senior American record in the snatch. Uh -huh. I, make, I make the 2014 Pan American team. I'm competing in the Dominican Republic. This is in 2014. After that, I win the national championships. I break, I break two American records. I attempted an addition, and I attempted four records, and I broke two records. So I had this amazing, crazy day. This is after three knee surgeries. This is at the age of 29 years old. Weightlifters really don't make it past their early 20s. So at 29 years old, I'm representing the United States. I now I go to the senior world championships. This is in November of 2014. I placed the highest for the United States in the past 10 years at a world championship. I break another American record. I attempt a couple more. So I'm just having a crazy year. Wow. 2015, I make the world championships again. I go into the 2016 Olympics being ranked the number one male. So, so all this is, so all of these are highlights I'm telling you. I compete in China in 2015. China flies me in to compete there. That was the highlight. I so went through. And, and you attribute this all to a keto diet? I relearned how to train the core. I relearned the glutes. But, but right. yeah, I, I don't use any. So 2012 was the last year I was using anti-inflammatories. I, 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 I do teas, I do turmeric, I do ginger. And so by me reducing the, the, the carbs, which break down into sugar, yeah. I was able to reduce my inflammation. Do you have any carbs in your diet now at all? I do, I do nuts. I, I, try to, I try to get them dry roasted, but, but I do get nuts. I do protein bars. I try to make sure it doesn't contain anything crazy. Right. That, that's where I get my carbs from. Right. The only fruit I eat is avocados, mostly meat. Shoot for red meat. I do do chicken. So, so just meat, uh, nuts, avocados. Yeah, that's awesome. Ginger, oregano oil, cayenne pepper is really good for putting, putting that on the food. Now yeah. I can avoid putting on Tiger Balm all over everything. And so, like learning a holistic approach yeah. because yeah. that I had from the age of seven in high school, I was just really loading up a cocktail of painkillers and ibuprofen because I thought that's how athletes had to do it. I was getting so many cortisone injections. I've had so many cortisone injections in my knees and in my back that the thought of it just scares me now. I was told at the age of 19, I'm, I'm sitting in the doctor's office, I'm, 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 I'm shedding a tear because he tells me by the age of 30, I'm going to need a knee replacement. How am I going to be an athlete? And I going to have a, I need to have this knee replacement all throughout my mid twenties. I was having bone on bone. It would hurt to stand for long periods. Now I'm at the beach. I'm walking miles. 
I can go hiking. And that's really understanding inflammation. Yeah, that's amazing. And what, I love, what, about, what I love about this is it's, this story is irrefutable proof. You'll read all these studies and you'll see all these things on Instagram like this works, this doesn't work. This isn't scientifically proven. I'm like, well, take a look at Derek. This is what happened. These are the facts. And this is, this is now the situation. So don't throw any study at me. Don't throw anything at yeah. me. Just please look at this, this, this reality. This, this happened. Um, and, and me, I wasn't paid by any keto industry or anything like that. It was, I was around people. They were talking about it. I started researching it. I had a little hope that it would work. Yeah. And, and it even, <laughs> was another highlight 2016 I, I hit a double body weight snatch 2017 I hit another body weight a double body weight snatch and less than 10 Americans in the history of the United States have ever snatched double body weight wow. it's single digits and so I'm doing it in my early 30s now yeah that's or mid 30s early yeah. 30s mid 30s so all that and just for all the people that bashing anti-inflammatory or keto i wasn't paid by those industries I, there was no financial there, there's no reason financially for me to even say this yeah that's yeah. there is no industry giving me money to say this and or and then i would also tell people in 2013 because dr kate shanahan who ranked i think the book was called ancient nutrition and she's the one that popularized paleo in the nba community because kobe would, would get on it and then he would use bone broth of course that's collagen yeah and it's all about healing the gut you have yeah. to cut inflammation down to start healing the gut to start the, to heal that gi tract mm. to balance your, your your levels in your body including your brain so and i became a, addicted to all these just to learning about it just so much so I'll, and in addition to that, I was learning, I was studying people like Dr. Stewart, I'm sorry, Professor Stuart McGill, Dr. Yeah. Fred. Yeah. He's big with rehabilitation of the glutes, the core, because I knew my yeah. movement patterns were off. Yeah. So in addition do you, to Do you do any of the knees over toes stuff as well? He, he actually actually he had came down to the gym in, in uh Venice where I train sometimes or where I train. And yeah, so he he comes down. My friends use a lot of his stuff. He yeah. he hung out there a couple of days. Uh, yeah. So I, I've seen yeah, his it, stuff. It's, yeah. it's for me. It's like um, because his story is also very interesting and very similar. Like people people will say, you know, they'll, they'll either send you down the drug path and they'll say you need to take this, you need to take this, or or they'll say no, you have to do it this way because this is the way we've always done it. Whereas I think a lot of people heal themselves by taking accountability for themselves, doing their own research, going outside the box, reading, educating themselves as much as they can possible about possible alternative methods or things that have worked for other people. And that way they fix themselves. I think um, people always educate themselves and not just rely on someone to tell them, give right. them a, a training plan. Take the training plan, learn from that, keep doing your research. Right. Right. Uh, Derek, I could talk to you all fucking day. Um, <laughs> we, you got, uh, you, you're just one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Um, just before we finish, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you. What What does your training look like now? Uh, how old are you right now, by the way? I have no idea. 47? 47? 37. 37. Okay. Oh, you're still young compared to me. Okay, so what? you still Olympic lift, obviously. Yeah, I'm still I'm still in the gym five, six days a week. Uh probably at least three or four, at least three of those days are Olympic weightlifting. Nice. Um I'm probably in that of my max lifts ever. I'm probably in the 80, I'm probably 75 to 85 percent of where I'm pushing into. I'm just other non-athletic related things. I have a day of basketball just individual drills try to get that in at least once a week because and, and it just helps me stay yeah. youthful that young i'm going back to something that i loved as a kid 
And I remember I started playing basketball again last year. And just all the hours I remember dribbling, shooting, practicing all these moves. And I'm staying active at the same time. Yeah. I don't have any kids now, but been telling everybody in 15, 20 years, I'm still going to be able to beat. My kid is not right. beating me. So I'm getting in stop. So I'm staying in top physical shape right now. Yeah. But if I, yeah. So, do you compete in any master stuff or do you not get involved in that so much? Uh, I'm more interested in beating a, a 20 year old. That would make me feel. Right. <laughs> my level, if I cranked it back up for six months, I do think I could win the senior nationals. Yeah. I think I could break records. That's just not where my energy is right now. It's more on my Mandarin. It's more on working on this uh, live experience entertainment company. I have pitch decks going out, being made now, and they go out next week. So just really the, the focus is there so I can get more money to do more things with the Kings of Wayla thing. Right. And so I realized, okay, we can't, we can't sit around and wait for lightning to strike. We got to get on the offensive. Yeah. So I said, okay, I need um, to for profit. Right. Right. Um, you kind of drew, you kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but if you had any a message for you know the youth and anybody in you know, who 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 are currently growing up in your situation, what would that what would that message be? I would say whatever the goal is, laser focus. Right. There's there are things that are probably going to happen to uh, a person that comes from a similar background. There are things that are going to happen every single day that's going to make it hard for them to want to continue on with whatever their mission was, whether that's to be an athlete, teacher, doctor, lawyer, president, whatever it is, there's things that are going to happen every single day that are going to throw you off your path. You got to make sure that every single day that that could be disassociating yourself from your friend that you have been friends with for years, a family member, they may be too negative. They may be causing you, if, if they're telling you to do something negative that doesn't help you with your goal in five, 10 or 20 years, you can't yeah. be around. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, the goal is so the goal. I'm talking about any yeah. outside forces. I'm talking about the forces that you've been around. Right. Those are gonna, you may have to. Yeah. You may have to sever that 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 connection. And yeah. so throughout my process to get here, I've had to, in order to keep going, I've had to lose a lot of friends. Right. So if you want to be comfortable, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a completely uncomfortable journey. And if you come from my situation, you're going to have to get used to being uncomfortable. Yeah. That's yeah, what you, the you become who you hang around. Is though you become who you hang around. Yeah. Um, and taking all this collectively, where you are right now, what would you say your your main purpose is moving forward? So as a human being on this planet, what is your purpose? Just this um, just this uh, this for profit I'm working on, why I really want to succeed at it because I have a lot of friends that I feel that that could that I could partner with, work with in this venture. And we can go all around the world doing it, listening to music, creating these amazing shows for, for people to attend. So that just makes me feel good because I just love live entertainment. I love music. And it'll be a, a way to connect with so many different people. I'm, I'm taking Mandarin Chinese, which is going to give me the ability to connect with an, with an additional billion people. And in the process, I'm going to be able to scale up this nonprofit and hopefully right. we get more of those around the country, country. So I'm doing all these different things. I'm dedicating my entire day, every single day, 100% effort to just doing things I enjoy. Like all right. these things that I absolutely enjoy. If I get whatever time on the daily basis, I get to work on the Kings of Weightlifting. That's a dream. That's something I enjoy. I'm working on Mandarin to open up all these new opportunities just like I had decades ago when I was able to get that passport, that passport opened up all these different opportunities to me to go. I've been to all these different countries now, so many different, I think I'm on my third passport. 
And so all that just opens my mind up even more. It, mm -hmm. it shows, it gives me even more hope from someone that is completely hopeful. Yeah. Well, uh, dude, you're, you're an incredible person. Um, everything you've done, everything you're doing, it's, it's just so inspirational. Like, and thank you so much for taking the time to, to come on today. Um, I want you to tell everyone, like, what's the best way to, to, to find you, to reach out to you, to understand more about the Kings of Weightlifting, to understand more about the, the for-profit organization that you've got going on? What, what's the best way to get in touch with you? So the best way to get in touch with me is you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at 4Derek. That's the number 4, D-E-R-R-I-C-K, 4Derek. The Kings of Weightlifting, you can find out more about the Kings of Weightlifting at kingsofweightlifting.com or the Kings of Weightlifting on Instagram or Facebook. And so we're all on there. Uh, the for profit, that's all going to be coming out soon. So you can follow me on my personal pages there. I will say that I threw a, an event last month. It was like a, a, a foreshadowing of the company. We had like the pre-party, the concert, then the after party. And so now I'm just going to scale that up and add some fireworks to it. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and guys, don't forget, we have got this event coming up on the 30th of December. We're going to raise money for, for Kings of Weightlifting uh, in this powerlifting event. Um, it's going to be at Barris Athletic Club on the 30th. Um, for details, just uh, reach out to us at info at or you can go on Instagram and you'll see it on there. Um, we're doing it in conjunction with like a Halloween themed thing. It's just going to be a super fun day. You don't have to be a competitive powerlifter to come. It's for everybody. Um, it's just a fun event to get together, test ourselves a little bit and, and raise some money for a great cause. Um, again, Derek, thank you so much for taking the time, brother. I, like I said, I could speak to you all day. I think we're going to have to do this again because there's a bunch of stuff I didn't even get to yeah. ask you that I want to know about, um, but we'll do it again, I'm sure. Um, but until then, brother, take care. I, I'm sure we'll connect soon. And uh, keep doing your thing, man. It's it's incredible. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Sarah. Speak to you soon, brother.